I'm Mo Rocca, and I'm excited to announce season four of my podcast, Mobituaries. I've got a whole new bunch of stories to share with you about the most fascinating people and things who are no longer with us. From famous figures who died on the very same day to the things I wish would die, like buffets, all that and much more. Listen to Mobituaries with Mo Rocca wherever you get your podcasts. Why is it that with sparkling water, I'm always playing guessing games with what flavor I'm drinking? Is it citrus? Is it aluminum can flavored? Mm, not sure. Sparkling ice, though, they really mean flavor. Like in-your-face flavor. Orange mango, black raspberry. Don't even get me started on the strawberry lemonade. Kiwi Strawberry slid right into my Taste Buds DMs last night and let them know who's boss. No subtleties there and no sugar either. But it does have vitamins and antioxidants. Find sparkling ice at a major grocery store or club retailer near you. Sparkling ice. Anything but subtle. Tax Act can think of a million things more fun than filing taxes. Tax Act is going to name some now. Sitting in traffic. Folding a fitted bedsheet. Listening to your coworker talk about his fantasy team. Digging a hole. Digging an even larger hole next to that original hole. Unfortunately, Tax Act's filing software can't make taxes fun. But Tax Act can help you get them done. Tax Act. Let's get them over with. I'm Jason Pack. And I'm Alex Hall Hall. And this is Disorder, the surprisingly good podcast where we try to find order in our mad, 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 mad world. This week, we're going to examine the regional roles played by Egypt and Iran and discuss British diplomacy towards those countries over the last decade or so, as well as throughout this current Israel Hamas war. Ever since the Israel-Gaza conflict erupted following Hamas's brutal attack on 7 October, we've been trying to present to disorder listeners novel ways of examining the broader regional context of the conflict. So as part of these efforts at contextualizing the conflict, we've been discussing the motivations and roles of various regional states and non-state actors towards the conflict, including Lebanon and Hezbollah, Yemen and the Houthis, and various Gulf states such as Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Qatar. Today, we're going to talk about the role and perspectives of two of the four most important state actors involved in the Israel-Palestine dispute, and those are Iran and Egypt. The former is an obvious and deliberate disorderer, and the latter plays a more ambivalent role with some major ordering potential as a mediator. Iran and Egypt are great ones to cover today because they offer an extraordinary study in contrasts, both in terms of their relationship and dealings with Israel and Hamas and their dealings with the outside world. So who better to help us understand these complicated countries than my former boss, Sir Geoffrey Adams, who served as British ambassador in both countries as well as Consul General to Jerusalem representing the UK to the Palestinians, and who during this interview I put on the spot regarding Western policy towards the entire Middle East by asking him, what would you do? Hello, orderers. As the war in Gaza becomes more protracted and the humanitarian toll more catastrophic, the fulcrum of efforts to find solutions and to intervene in the conflict has shifted towards the regional powers, where it seems that their publics remain engaged and enraged. While to my mind, Western publics and diplomats have made quite clear that they're not really ready to propose big picture, cross-cutting, implementable solutions. I've spoken in episode nine, the 2023 Israeli-Hamas war, could the Qataris help us order the disorder, about my very passionately held view that Qatar, working alongside other GCC countries, could play that key role in mediating a solution for the administration of post-war Gaza. But let's just be frank, that solution is today pretty much dead in the water. It had a chance in the early days if 
It was backed by strong Anglo-American efforts to get our regional players and allies on board. But now today, with Netanyahu striking such a defiant pose, there won't be a Palestinian state and this and that. I just can't see this solution coming about. We also spoke with Nathan Brown in episode 16, The Struggle for Leadership of the Islamic World, about how the Gaza conflict presents a truly existential danger for Egypt. And that was really enlightening for me. So I want to remind listeners that Nathan put forward this kind of terrifying view, which is that blowback from the Gaza-Israel conflict and any possible population transfer would profoundly undermine regime security and legitimacy in Cairo and could ignite a regional conflict. I think the point we're trying to extrapolate out here is that the incentive structures for Iran and Egypt are completely contradictory. Iran, its ideological underpinning is predicated on opposition to Israel, and it is trying to gain strength and fuel conflict and gain support in the global south for its position opposing Israel. Whereas the chaos in Gaza poses an existential threat for Egypt if floods of Palestinians are allowed to cross over into Egypt. And Egypt, of course, is directly affected by the spread of the conflict to the Red Sea because all that shipping that comes up through the Red Sea then has to go through the Suez Canal, which provides a huge source of revenue for Egypt. So Egypt has an incentive to try and keep a lid on this, to cooperate, to try and get a ceasefire. Iran is trying to draw strength from fueling this conflict and inflaming it. And that's the challenge. So without further ado, let's hear from our guest, Sir Jeffrey Adams, who provides an absolute masterclass in diplomatic eloquence and strategic insight. I think the word that sums up my time in Iran is frustrating. I find it immensely frustrating because, you know, Iran is an incredibly interesting country with a rich history, great culture, still full of educated, interesting people. So it should be the most brilliant place to be a diplomat. But in practice, to be a British ambassador there is a bit of a, a nightmare because you are the focus of the unremitting hostility of the Iranian regime. So it's an uncomfortable experience being a British ambassador in Tehran, no question. But above all, it's a frustrating experience. Do you think we're right to keep an embassy there? Absolutely, yes. It's the job of diplomats to be in tough places. When times get tough, it's more important that diplomats should be there. And being there doesn't imply any form of approval or support. It's just that we're there and we can talk if we need to talk. We can be talked to and we can have people on the ground to try and understand this complicated, sophisticated, frustrating country. And I think the, the contrast with the Americans is very clear. As you know, the Americans haven't had an embassy there for good reason since 1979, after their embassy was attacked and their diplomats were taken hostage. But they really feel the absence of an embassy there. And it makes their difficult relationship even more difficult. And also, I'm guessing for the Iranian people, it's really important that they feel the world hasn't abandoned them. I mean, was there a distinction between the regime's attitudes and the attitudes of ordinary people? I mean, my understanding is that quite a lot of Iranian people really admire America. Do they feel the same about the UK? They absolutely do, uh, Alex. And, and that was one of the weirdnesses about Iran, but what's something you can only really experience living there is this fantastic disconnect between the hostility of the the regime and the people around it and the attitudes of the Iranian people. I mean, I used to say that the only place in Iran where British people were under any threat was inside the British embassy. Oh, <laughs> I'd be quite happy to walk down a dark alley in Tehran any day of the week and you'd find nothing but friendliness. Uh, ordinary Iranian people aren't remotely anti-Western, not anti-British. Sure, they know the history they don't feel hostile. So it's completely weird. We used to sit in the embassy with demonstrations going on outside, completely orchestrated by the regime. Of people, we actually saw people being paid and given a wheelbarrow of rotten tomatoes to throw at our gates or stones at our, 
at our windows. It was all completely uh, confected. But the other part of it, which is a really important part you've kind of referred to, is that the people in Iran who are struggling for better human rights or for some human rights, the women in recent years who've been protesting in the most brave and moving way, yeah, the embassies of foreign countries who are there are kind of beacons for them, beacons and reminders that the world has not forgotten them. Yeah, so looking at Iran today, I mean, there are these waves of popular unrest. We saw it, was it called the Green Revolution, right? And the so called, yeah. The so called Green Revolution. And then we saw the demonstrations around the brutal killing of Masa Amini. So there are these sort of popular frustrations. How secure is the regime, do you think, today? I think the best way of explaining it is that when the Islamic Republic was set up after the revolution of 1979, Khomeini set up a very sophisticated governmental system, deliberately difficult to overthrow. It's not as if there is one dictator or one group of people who are running the country. There's a whole network of control and organization which makes it extremely difficult to overthrow. That's on the one hand. But on the other hand, I think there is widespread discontent, some of it political, much of it economic, as in many countries. But it's inchoate. There's not one liberation movement or one popular movement. There are different people who are angry and dissatisfied for different reasons. And so it's difficult to transform that into an effective mechanism to overthrow. This as I say, hard to overthrow, deliberately hard to overthrow regime. So I think that the Islamic Republic will probably collapse under the weight of its own contradictions in due course. It could well last as long as communism in the Soviet Union, for example. But that took 80 years, didn't it? And it may take the same amount of time in Iran. And what motivates Iran's extreme hostility towards Israel? And do the general population share that regime's hatred or declared hatred? I would say that the Palestinian issue is not a major sort of top three issue for most Iranians at all. The Arab world in general, and Palestine in particular, seems, when you're in Tehran, quite a long way away. Iran obviously is a Persian country, not an Arab country. It's an Asian country, it's a West Asian country, and it feels connected to places like India, Pakistan, Turkey. It doesn't really feel closely connected to the Arab world. So I think most Iranian, the proverbial Tehran taxi driver, would sort of think, well, Palestinians, it's not really our problem. Now, that said, you know, I don't want to downplay it. They would no doubt feel sympathy towards the sort of humanitarian plight of the Palestinians on a human level. And of course, there's the motivating factor of Al-Quds, you know, Jerusalem as a holy city in Islam. So it's significant, for example, that the regime calls the external arm of the Revolutionary Guards the Quds force, the Jerusalem force, the notionally the force that will retake Jerusalem for the Muslims and drive out the Jews. But that leads on to, so this is the propaganda of the regime. You ask what motivates the thing. And so this was one of the key pillars of the ideology of the Islamic Revolution in 1979. So pre-revolution, the Shah, as you know, had rather straightforward relations with Israel, had a relationship with Israel. And part of the revolution against him was, but this is wrong, this is against Islam, this is non un-Islamic, we're going to, the proper Muslims should be fighting for the liberation of Jerusalem. And that remains, you know, a massively important part of their ideology, as I say, and revolutionary ideology is what keeps it going. At the same time, it strengths and it weakness, in my view, because at that kind of revolutionary rhetoric only goes so far. It doesn't give ordinary Iranians the answers to the questions they have. It doesn't provide jobs. It doesn't provide economic opportunity. It is just that. It's, it's the ideology and it's a slogan, isn't it, really? Yeah, that's like all weak authoritarian regimes. They sort of manufacture exactly. international issues. And then they also can blame domestic exactly. dissent on foreign exactly. spies, right? This is one of the great challenges we face in dealing with Iran, how to protect and to support the people who deserve our protection and support. But more widely, how do you support Iranians who would like to be free and who look to us for help? If you blunder in, if you try blatantly to support them, you're then open to the 
charge that, oh, this is interference. Yet again, this is the narrative of foreign British intervention, interference in Iranian affairs. But at the same time, you know, you can't stand back. You have to support it. One of the most impactful things I did when I was ambassador in Tehran was that I offered a group of Iranian filmmakers and artists as a very sophisticated and successful Iranian film industry. I said to them, here's a ticket to the Edinburgh Festival in Scotland. Do whatever you want for a fortnight. It's a life-changing experience for them. <laughs> you know, they came back exposed to the amazing things that go on at the Edinburgh Festival every year here. And it, it sort of inspired them to carry on with their work. And so that's the kind of, sort of intervention we need to do, which doesn't interfere, it doesn't try and manipulate or dominate, but it just shows Iranians what is available in the world. I mean, getting that balance right is so hard for the reasons you've said. And then you've also got the nuclear dossier. You may yep. know I was once head of human rights department in the Foreign Office. And I, I remember... remember. I remember hearing the words of Shirin Ibadi, the Nobel laureate from yep. Iran, yep. Yep. saying that we were making a mistake by prioritizing the nuclear issue rather than the human rights and democracy issues in Iran, because a democratic country that respected the human rights of its citizens and was accountable to its people wouldn't be pursuing nuclear weapons and would be less likely to use them in a dangerous way. And it's the very nature of the Iranian regime that makes its pursuit of nuclear weapons problematic. Do you agree with her? Or do you feel we had no choice? We just had to deal with the situation we had at the time? I'm saying both. I totally understand and respect that argument. And obviously, I knew Shireen Abadi and have huge respect for her too. And I totally get that. I also think since we had the opportunity to develop a negotiation with Iran over their nuclear program, we had an opportunity to get them to accept actually what are their obligations under international law, their membership of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Since we had that opportunity, we should take it. Because it wasn't an alternative, either do that or pursue human rights. The answer is we need to do both. The other criticism that's often made of the nuclear negotiations, not only is it it didn't deal with our human rights concerns, but it also didn't deal with Iran's malign role in the region. Yeah, exactly. You know, all the subversion they do, the support for terrorism. Why didn't it do with any of, any of that? Well, it's quite perfectly true. It didn't. But I was quite clear, you know, in the many years that I was involved in those negotiations, the alternative was not between what we had and a better deal. <laughs> the alternative was between what we had and no deal. <laughs> right. that, was the, that was the question. And if we had tried to introduce Iranian malign activities in the region into what was already an exceptionally difficult negotiation on nuclear issues, then we would certainly not have had an agreement. It must have been so disappointing when the US pulled the rug from that deal. I was in the embassy in Washington just before President Trump did that. And I remember we were sending sure. our finest diplomat, Boris Johnson, I believe, at the time. <laughs> if I'm allowed to laugh at that. I'm unfortunate. I think it was Boris Johnson was foreign secretary and going to lobby them and say, don't do it. But they did. And now you've had Biden's administration hoping to put the pieces back together again. But is the deal dead now? I think it's pretty moribund, Alex. And the reason is not so much because of the Americans now. That was difficult enough, as you described. But actually, a new element is the Russia problem, I would say. And I think since first Crimea and then Ukraine, Russia has now effectively sort of used the opportunity of uh, US non-compliance to say, well, this is nothing to us as well. And of course, Russia was a really crucial component in the party to the deal and component to the process. Uh, it's hard to imagine now, but you know, all those years when I was doing it, so sort of 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, that kind of thing, my Russian officer number you know, was a close colleague and a constructive colleague. And obviously, they had a slightly different take on things. Russia, for really good reasons of its own, wanted to be part of this deal. Russia didn't want a nuclear-armed Iran on its southern border any more than any of us did. And so Russia had, had a really significant uh, reason, motivation for being part of this. 
And now, of course, all that has changed. That's what makes me rather pessimistic about the specifics of the nuclear deal, is it's hard to imagine Russia coming back into it, frankly. The other element you were touching on as part of the problems with the nuclear deal is it failed to address Iran's sort of wider meddlings, its relationships with Hezbollah and Hamas and its wider destabilizing activities. So actually, this takes us very up to what is now going on with Israel and Gaza and Iran's hand behind Hezbollah, the Houthis, Hamas. Iran has launched attacks into Syria, into northern Iraq, and pretty recently into Pakistan. Mm. So not making itself very popular within the region. Has it bitten off more than it can chew here? I think they're trying to position themselves as the toughest opponent of Israel, the only people who support, the people who are actually fighting Israel. So although they're not popular with many, not all governments in the region, but I wonder whether they're looking for popularity with ordinary people in the region. That's the question. And I don't think it's bitten off more than it can chew. I mean, I think that the Iranians are pretty good at calibrating subversion, if I can put it that way, calibrating their provocations. And I think that's what they're doing for the Houthis in the Bab el-Mendeb and the Red Sea. I think that's what they're doing in their management of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Unfortunately, and I say this with no pleasure at all, I think things are going pretty well for Iran at the moment. So even more unfortunately, are we playing into their playbook with our actions? So Israel's devastating assault on Gaza, the UK and the US attacking the Houthis to try and protect safe passage through the Red Sea. Are we sort of playing directly into the Iranians' dream game plan here? No. I, well, I, I think there are two or three different things going on there. On freedom of navigation in the Bab al-Mandab so through the Red Sea and the Houthis' attacks on shipping, I'm myself pretty hard line on this. I think that is a clear red line that they have crossed. And I think we in countries like us have every right enforcing freedom of navigation in that waterway. As to Gaza itself, I don't know about who you mean by we, but I mean, I, I fear that Hamas is playing a brutally clever game. They are luring Israel into uh, ever more destructive actions. Progressively, therefore, Israel is losing the sympathy of the world, which it so rightly had on the 7th and 8th of October. And I fear that is Hamas's game and indeed Iran's game. And it's brutal because it rests upon innocent Palestinian lives being lost in their thousands, literally in their thousands. And so it's a reminder of just how brutal Hamas and its supporters are. Are the Israeli government right to continue down this path? Can Hamas be destroyed in this fashion? I mean, ideologically, they can emerge stronger and the victors out of this. Well, that's the risk, Alex, yes. And, and as you know, not just from this, but from numerous other occasions, is that most experts, of which I am not one, but most experts on terrorism would say that you defeat terrorism by a combination of direct action, yes, but then also there needs to be a political component. You need to remove the alleged justification for terrorism. You need to remove the reason why people support terrorists or even indulge in terrorism themselves. And that's why we British, but also to be fair to them, even the Americans, (laughs) are now firmly calling for a so-called political horizon. You need to offer people hope. You need to offer ordinary people, the idea that one day, sooner or later, their aspirations will be realized. And I'm sure that it's the absence of that horizon that led to the kind of nihilism that was so prevalent in Gaza, which itself produced people who are prepared to carry out these appalling acts of terrorism. I used to go to Gaza you know, when I was concentrating in Jerusalem. That was my parish. That was my patch. And I'm afraid we could all see it unfolding before our very eyes. We could see generation after generation living in misery and living without hope and being told from the day of their birth that the people responsible for their misery were the people living over the fence in Israel. 
that's the the tragedy of what has happened. So yes, you have mentioned that we need to be offering the Palestinians a realistic, viable alternative. Does that still depend upon a state of their own? And is that still feasible? It would be unbelievably difficult to fashion a contiguous Palestinian state in the West Bank, even with a corridor to Gaza, which is what what we seem to be very close to 20 years ago. That's, that now would be unbelievably difficult on practical grounds. So it would be unbelievably difficult on political grounds because you now have not just Netanyahu, who are not just uh, the current Israeli government, but the real sense, as you know, Alex, of the centre of gravity in Israeli politics has moved significantly to the right in the last 20 years. And it's hard to envisage a sort of an Israeli government, Israeli leadership that would be progressive, I would say visionary enough to realize that this is a solution. But against all the odds, and this goes back to even when I was working still in the foreign office, you know, people, ministers were saying to me, why is our policy of support for a two-state solution when it's clearly dead? You know, and, and that's a totally legitimate challenge. And I was being challenged on that six or eight years ago. Even then, it seemed incredibly implausible and a distant project. But I actually argued, and I continue to argue, we should carry on talking about it. And the reason being is, what is the alternative? Right, because you can't drive the Palestinians into the sea and they are not going to be resettled elsewhere. But in order for that to happen, you need partners on the Palestinian side You know, where is the Nelson Mandela who will be willing to properly forge a durable peace and inspire the Palestinian people enough to put behind them the humiliations and the setbacks? So you were in the West Bank and Gaza. Are there people out there who could perform that role? We used to hear about Marwan Barghouti as someone who was younger and more inspirational. We've got this sclerotic, aging leadership of the Palestinian Authority. There have been some people in the West saying the Palestinians have to reform their institutions. There have to be fresh elections to try and get a different kind of leadership. Did you meet people who could play that Mandela kind of leading them out of the wilderness? Look, and I was in South Africa, actually, at the end of apartheid, and I used to meet Mandela. So I know what Mandela's like. (laughs) And I know what a miracle it was that he and some others were present at that period. It's a big part of the Israeli narrative, or at least the Netanyahu narrative, that Israel has never had a partner for peace over the years. And as someone who worked very closely with the new Arafat and I've known the Palestinian leadership over the years. I mean, you know, that is not completely untrue <laughs> in the sense that, you know, I always felt that for all the failures of some people on the Israeli side to take the necessary bold steps for peace, I always felt that the problem on the Palestinian side is that there was no one who wanted to take responsibility for what for them would be a historic compromise. The failure of imagination, I think, too often in the West is that we don't put ourselves in the in the shoes of the Palestinians and realize that, you know, even to them, a two-state solution, recognizing the state of Israel on half or the better half of Palestinian land is itself a massive compromise. I always felt that the problem was Arafat and people like him didn't want to be the person who went down in history as the person who made that compromise on behalf of the Palestinian people, and that it was much more comfortable to be in a position of resistance and oppression than it was to be a statesman-like. And that's sad, and it's mainly sad, because the people who suffer from that are not them, but the Palestinian people. So let's turn to Egypt, because Egypt borders Israel, it borders Gaza, It has control of the Rafa crossing. You've had Israeli politicians suggesting that Egypt should open its borders and just let them all flood into Egypt. So you were ambassador in Egypt much more recently, up to 2021, I believe. So you have a pretty recent perspective. Egypt has a dreadful human rights record, (laughs) rounds up dissidents, suppresses civil society, And yet, it is the recipient of massive amounts of international aid, US aid. The EU is looking to sign a new agreement with Egypt, partly bribing it to stop migrants reaching Europe. So that's a difficult relationship to navigate as well. 
What was it like being ambassador there? And how did you juggle that? Because there was no bones about our criticism of Iran. But in Egypt, we were a partner with them, but they also had an atrocious human rights record. That's absolutely right, Alex. Being a British ambassador in Cairo is very different from being a British ambassador in Tehran. We're not the subject of the same kind of hostility, but the relationship is complicated. What it has in common, I would say, interestingly, is history. And just as Iran feels keenly, particularly the negative aspects of the British historical role, so in Egypt, which was occupied by Britain between 1880 and 1923 without anyone's permission, and where the British ambassador to this day, who's probably seen it, lives in a great sort of proconsular palace on the Nile, bitterly resented by Egyptians. There's all these different elements are swirling about, and it makes for, as you say, a complicated and troublesome relationship. I was quite clear that British interests in Egypt rest in its stability. Egypt, as you know, is a massive country, over 100 million people, 102 million people going up by a million a year, and still, for all its difficulties, has immense cultural, political, social weight in the Arab world and the wider Islamic world. One in four Arabs is an Egyptian. And so the consequences of state failure in Egypt would be incalculably greater than state failure in Libya or Syria or Iraq or Yemen or all these other places that have failed. The consequences would be really bad in terms of, you mentioned migration, export of terrorism, economic instability, the strategic importance of the Suez Canal, all these things, and not least, the strategic relationship with Israel. Egypt, alongside Jordan, took the, I think, extremely brave decision back in the 1970s to sign peace treaties with Israel, because I think we were talking earlier about visionary leaders, or the lack of them in the Palestinian case, But I think both Egypt and Jordan in the 1970s, in the shape of President Sadat and King Hussein, had visionary leaders who realized before most that Israel was there to stay. They may not like it, but it was a fact. They needed to accommodate that and work with it. And Egypt and Jordan did that and have done that to this day. So the fact that war between Egypt and Israel or between Jordan and Israel is now inconceivable is actually the bedrock of Israeli security and therefore of importance to us. So that's the the sort of framework for our relationship with Egypt. So the question is, how do you then pursue it? How do you then pursue very legitimate human rights concerns? My argument with, and this is the whole point of diplomats, we need to be able to do more than one thing at a time. (laughs) We could work with Egypt on their economic development for the benefit of the Egyptian people. We can work with Egypt on their relationship with Israel, which is hugely important in the role they're playing in Gaza. But at the same time, we can keep on at them, particularly with our allies and partners on human rights. We need to do all of those things. And that's why it's a complicated job. Well, you referring to Anwar Sadat and his brave decision to conclude a peace deal with Israel for alongside which paid, Jordan, for which, he paid, for which with his life. he paid with his life. And then a few years later, Yitzhak Rabin paid with his life for signing the Oslo Accord. So it's a, you know, there are real issues at stake here. But I want to push you a little bit on this Egypt relationship because it strikes me it's there is a parallel with Iran, which is our long-term interests and our short-term interests. And when I was head of human rights in the Foreign Office, it was always so frustrating dealing on Saudi Arabia and Egypt. And I was serving there after the Iraq war and the horrible attacks on 9-11, and America was leading this sort of effort to democratize the Middle East. But it seems to me there's sort of a contradiction. We'll never get to the long term because our short term needs will always take precedence and always that need to preserve that peace with Israel, our need to try and keep a lid on unrest means we end up collaborating with a very repressive military regime. And we can lecture them all we like about you need to do this on human rights and sometimes we'll get an individual human rights defender or two released, but the system itself remains in place. So how do we ever get from that short term to the long term? I kind of see the point you're making, Alex, but I think you're assuming that we outsiders, we foreigners, we Westerners, 
actually have a very determining role over whether these regimes live or die. And I refer you to the so-called Arab Spring. The regime of President Assad in Syria was very nearly overthrown, not by anyone, no Westerners, but by the Syrian people themselves. The Tahrir Square uh, revolution of 2011 that overthrew Mubarak led to a Muslim Brotherhood president indirectly, and then indirectly to President Sisi after that. This was all done by the Egyptian people themselves. This was not us. And although I think the, you know, the Arab Spring so-called turned out to be the massive disappointment and didn't lead to the establishment of lovely democracies as, as some people hoped, I think one of the crumbs of comfort one can take from it is that it marked a moment when the peoples of the Middle East and of the Arab world in particular started taking responsibility for their own futures and not blaming it constantly on outsiders. So in the case of Egypt, you know, you were pretty fierce about uh, President Sisi in the world. And you're, you know, you're not wrong. They're not perfect. But we can work with them to reform. We had some really good, when I was in Egypt, economic reform development packages. But what actually we did is we paid for better conditions for women in garment factories. So they were making suits in Cairo for Marks and Spencer in Britain. And if you put in nice lavatories for the women, if you laid on decent buses for them, if you made sure they were treated with respect and dignity on the shop floor, women would come. And that's such a win because it means they'd start paying taxes, takes them out of the informal into the formal economy, means they send their children to school, means they have fewer children, which the ma- deals with that massive population. It's a massive win. So things like that at the margin, which you hope will lead to a domino effect, we can actually influence and, and affect the economy, but only at the margin. I do think one of the worst things about the sort of Iraq war, Blair era, to some extent the Cameron era in British foreign policy, there was a kind of hubris about it. There was a kind of feeling that, well, what we say and what we do will matter. You know, we can change countries, we can change regimes, we can change things. That's just not the case. We can affect things at the margin, and we can and we should stand up for what we believe in. There's no question about that. But in the end, I concluded that we should be much more modest in our ambitions and modest in the realization of what we can actually achieve. And it's things like better conditions in factories for women. (laughs) It's not about, we can't deal with this regime, you know, we should overthrow it. So, Jeffrey, if you were still private secretary to our current foreign secretary or director general political in the foreign office, what would you be recommending the British government should be doing now vis-a-vis Israel and Gaza? Well, I was I have been asked that question a few times over the years. The first thing I would say is there's no shame. Indeed, there's lots of advantages in sticking to established principles in international diplomacy and in international law, in fact. And I think you depart from those principles at your peril. You know, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip are occupied territories in international law. The whole city of Jerusalem has a separate legal status, the status which has not been determined. So you don't fiddle around with moving embassies or recognizing this or doing this. Don't do that unless you know it's part of a wider package. So I always I discourage ministers from too many initiatives. <laughs> and I used to say in that context, you know, take a leaf out of the book of countries like Egypt and Jordan. I come back to my admiration for them. These are countries that are much closer to Israel than we are, <laughs> but have been living with this problem this issue for many years, and they still stick to the existing principle. What is the legal status of these different places and these different peoples? And and what is the better outcome, which is based on international law, a succession of UN resolutions, uh, and ultimately the aspiration for the two-state solution, which we were talking about earlier. These are not bad things. These are good things. (laughs) And you throw them away uh, at your peril. The second uh, thing I always used to say is, Uh, we, the UK, should not and cannot do things on our own. We have a historical responsibility, many would argue, I would argue, uh, for the Palestinian issue because of our historical role. But a British initiative or a British role is not going to be effective. We need to be joined up, ideally, 
uh, with our closest European uh, partners uh, and crucially, of course, with the United States. We need to find the common ground between them and then come as a group to the Israelis and come as a group to the Palestinians. After the break, how can we get the international community aligned on the Israel-Gaza issues? And how can we order the disorder? Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. This edict identifies Jesus of Nazareth as a heretic and a blasphemer. This season on The Chosen. There are those for whom this will set off a series of events. My followers won't understand. Lazarus, come out! I guess you're not holding back anymore. I can't. I'm out of time. See season four of The Chosen in theaters on February 1st, starting with episodes one, two, and three. Get your tickets now at thechosenriseup.com. Wow, Alex, what a great interview. I couldn't disagree with a single word that Sir Jeffrey said there. I think he sketched out some really important principles that are in fitting with the global enduring disorder concept and and things that we talk about a lot on this show. You know, for example, the idea that medium powers like Egypt and Iran cannot be dictated to by a disunited international, i.e. Western community. And that domestic and global structural factors shape the rise and falls of regimes from Libya to Syria to Egypt. And it's those structural factors that dictate how those regimes relate to their populaces and form foreign policy. So although we didn't use the term, I would like to claim a sir, and in this case, Sir Jeffrey, as an avid follower and acolyte of the global enduring disorder paradigm. I hope Jeffrey heard that. So I think what's fascinating drawing out from what he said is how so much of a country's foreign policy is dictated by their internal domestic calculations. And so we in the West can try to put pressure on countries, but we can't even do that with Israel, who is supposed to be our biggest partner in the region. Netanyahu has made it extremely clear right now that he is not prepared to consider the two-state solution. He has his own objectives. And his position is very much predicated not just on the horrific attacks of 7th of October, which of course changed the assessment of security and risk in Israel. It would be astonishing if it didn't. That's quite understandable. But there's also the domestic political dynamic. And then how we respond to what's going on in the Middle East is also influenced by our domestic politics. I mean, it's been said, for example, is Biden losing votes because he's perceived as too close to Israel. Yeah, this topic gets me very, very worried and very frustrated, Alex. I think that Biden doesn't want Palestinian children to be dying in Gaza, and it's so unfair. I mean, I was just having a Pakistani-American friend over for dinner a few nights ago. He's like, oh, my family isn't voting for Biden anymore. And I was like, oh, why? Gaza, it's his fault. And it really hurts me because... What is Biden going to do? We're not going to invade Israel. It's a nuclear state with a democratically elected government. But it's just like when Obama 
said to Cameron, I don't really think this referendum thing is a great idea. And then when they did the Brexit, like, uh, you should do like a soft Brexit. Like Obama is like, we're not that into this whole hard Brexit thing, but we couldn't leverage them because Britain is such a close ally and a nuclear power. So I think that that's a really important thing to reset here. When we're talking about how difficult it is to pressure Egypt or Iran to do what we want, and it's very difficult. How can we pressure a democratically elected government that's a nuclear power? The other point I want to tease out from the interview, and I think is something we need to grapple with more on this podcast, is this issue of overreach and hubris versus concerted, effective collective action. Now, Jeffrey was talking about the fact that we have been guilty of hubris. We can't dictate what happens internally across the Middle East. We can't just wave our magic wands and have democracy bloom in the desert. And the Arab Spring was about people in the region taking account for themselves. And yet, I do worry about the implications of that, which is that we can only do very small things at the margins because an over and over theme of this podcast is that we need to be more effective, we need to be more coherent, and that when we do work collectively, we can make a difference. So which is it? Are we guilty of hubris? Are we trying to do too much or are we failing to do enough? Which is it, Jason? Wow, that's a really fascinating way of phrasing that, Alex. I think it can be both. So there's no doubt that the George W. Bush era was one of imperial hubris, not only with the invasion of Iraq, but mismanaging the NATO allies, like we heard with Jamie Shea in our first NATO episode. Imperial hubris led America to not build coalitions and to try to act alone. And, and that's something that I have a lot of regret and shame for. However, we then have done too much the opposite, which is not being willing to stick our neck out and confront disorderers coherently like Russia and even Iran, because we don't want to make the Iraq mistake of being seen to intervene. I would argue in Libya, the opposite mistake was made as in Iraq. In Iraq, we forced nation building and regime change on a country that didn't want it. And in Libya, when the people were ready to overthrow Gaddafi and they needed more of our help in the reconstruction phase, we didn't give it to them. So we're doing a lot of the opposite mistake now. To answer your question, dealing with Egypt and our allies in the region, who we have some many policy and domestic differences with, you know, the UAE has human rights violations, the Saudis legion human rights violations, but they're still our allies. We need to work with them on the things that we both have shared interests. They may not want to do like democracy promotion in their own countries, but I think that they would be keen to maybe have more women's education. We can work together but probably not from the position of imperial hubris because it just pisses people off and and causes a backfire. I'm all about coalitions and we can have coalitions on issues that we agree with, with people that we don't agree with everything. Like, can we make coalitions with these countries or are we just going to impose on them? We need to make coalitions. So that's kind of my takeaway from what he said. Okay. First of all, I'm going to call you out on the Iraqis didn't want regime change. I think they were delighted to see Saddam Hussein toppled. The problem was there was no plan for the day after. And I agree with you, it was imperial overreach. It was hubris. It wasn't part of a concerted international action and there wasn't sufficient planning. So there were many, many things that went wrong with Iraq. But people were happy to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Between the two of us, Alex, who was traveling around randomly, both on foot and by hailing cabs in Iraq in 2003. Was that me or was that you? <laughs> you mean they would rather still have Saddam Hussein no, there? What about and the Kurds? When I was in the Shia what area. The, what about the Shiites? What about of the- Of course. When I was in the Shia areas in Najaf and Karbala and even in, in you know the Marsh Arab areas, people were very happy in October, November 2003. But the honeymoon ended very, very quickly. Yes. And they would have been happy to get rid of Saddam, but not according to our timetable and in our way. And there were lots of fears about how it was done. But I digress. Anyway, what I do agree is that as a result of Iraq and Afghanistan, which I think we can say were both highly flawed interventions and didn't succeed in all their aims, we have had a yo-yo policy where 
there was that sense we'd overreached. So now we've drawn back. So we've sort of yo-yoed inconsistently backwards and forwards. And we've also shown the world, this is a principle of enduring disorder. We have repeatedly shown to countries like Russia and China that we don't have the staying power. I've never forgotten my time in India when we were telling the Indians over and over again, no, we're committed to the long term in Afghanistan. We're determined to make a success of it. And they told us, Afghanistan is in our neighborhood and one day you are going to leave and we are going to have to deal with the consequences. And of course they were right. And this is unfortunately what we may be doing in Ukraine as well. It really does look possible we are going to cut back our aid to Ukraine and Russia will have been able to sit us out. So that is a feature of disorder, this inconsistency in our engagement. So we can make a difference when we are concerted, sustained, collective, but we have to last the course. So perhaps that's the lesson I draw from this. But I want to put a question back to you, Jason. You and I both agree that medium powers ideally should step up a bit more, not just in this region, but around the world. What interests me about the US and the UK acting so swiftly to try and combat the Houthis' disruption of navigation in the Red Sea is what if they that has immediately fueled the perception that we are there acting on behalf of Israel again? And the UK and the US have made completely clear this has nothing to do with our views on the Israel-Gaza situation. This is about protecting freedom of navigation on the high seas, and this is a global good. But it's allowed a lot of countries to free ride. I mean, China depends upon safe passage. Egypt depends on safe passage. All these other countries depend on safe passage. And by the UK and the US leaping in so quickly, we have just earned a lot of opprobrium and a lot of people are free riding on us. So I want to ask you, what if we had just held back a little bit more and let the Houthis keep attacking shipping? Would other countries have stepped up? Because it would eventually started really hurting them. No, I agree there are complex perceptions here, Alex, but it is worth noting that the US and UK did build a global coalition. It's not just the Netherlands and some Scandinavian countries who are helping us, and they are. There's about 28 countries, I think, right now. Bahrain has launched airstrikes, okay. and Bahrain is, is an Arab ally. So, I mean, I want to point that out. But you're hitting on something. Egypt is the one who's going to suffer the loss in Suez Canal transit fees. They are the most proximately interested. It could crater their economy so that they need more IMF bailout loans. Whereas for us, it would mean, oh, the global supply chain is a little bit more difficult. Firms have to wait a few more weeks to get their goods going around the Cape of Good Hope. You know what I mean? It's not existential. So why is it that the Egyptians can't mediate a response? And the answer is that the Egyptians and Chinese can't mediate a response because they don't like the optics of it. They can't be seen to be confronting the Houthis who claim to be doing an action in support of the Palestinians. Yeah, they're free riders. They're free riders. Again, I 100% agree. And I love that you're using that term because the very nature of my belief in ordering is that we need to share the burden of ordering and we can't allow, oh, it's the role of just America or just NATO to do ordering and everyone else gets to free ride. And no. criticize. No. I want a global community to solve these global issues. And it is a great potential lost opportunity. What if we had had a conference and we probably couldn't invite Iran to the conference, but we could invite a range of Sunni Arab regimes from Bahrain to the Emirates to Saudi and the UAE and Egypt and said, hey, we understand that you don't want to intervene in Yemen, but what are we going to do about this shipping thing? It's affecting delivering goods from your ports. Do you support this, that, and the other? And maybe we could have gotten an Arab League resolution. But the, of course, the Arab League is disunited and Algeria and Syria would veto whatever. But I'm pushing even further. How about letting the situation get so bad that they convened the conference and asked us to do it? Oh, God, Alex. I, I wish that there was a world that that would come about in. I really, really do. Because 
I do think that things could get so bad in various domains like climate change and elsewhere that there could be an impetus for non-traditional powers to demand greater ordering. But I'm not sure I want to see things get that bad because if we extend your analogy to Ukraine, imagine if Biden didn't rush them the military aid that we need and we said, let's just wait for the EU to form an EU army. You know, we're going to have to wait. This is in the European backyard. We're going to not do anything. We're going to wait to see if the Europeans can not only create the conference, but can form a kinetically capable and integrated EU army to fund and train the Ukrainians. But that's a different circumstance. There was no opposition to the US sending support and assistance to Ukraine, only from Russia, of course. But I'm talking about in the Middle East, where these countries, none of whom necessarily like what the Houthis are doing. But you're asking doing. them to grow up. You're yes. asking them to put their rhetorical positions yes. where their real positions are. Yes. I had this thought when I lived in Syria in 2004. If only the regime could say out loud what it's actually doing, because they did a whole range of, I'm talking before the Hariri murder, where there was a lot of maturity on the Bashar al-Assad regime feelers to restart the peace talks with Israel, feelers about a withdrawal from Lebanon, working with the West, moving away from the Iranians. But of course, they couldn't have said any of that publicly for fear of domestic backlash and undercutting their Ba'athi Arab nationalist credentials. Yes, would I like that the regimes could grow up and say what their real positions are? Yes, I don't think it's going to happen right now, this second, given the domestic pressures that they face from the Palestinian crisis. And the Israelis don't make it easy for them, Alex. But as we said in previous episodes, the only possible way to make sense of this hideous situation now is the hope that it has got so bad that it might force and galvanize. And we are seeing the nations in the region trying to come up with new peace deals. I mean, Saudi Arabia hasn't washed its hands and said, right, that's it, all possibility of a deal with Israel and recognition is off the tables. It's still offering it. And Egypt hasn't broken off its treaty with Israel, nor has Jordan. So there are some tiny rays of hope there. I think that's exactly right, Alex. The point is medium powers have become relatively more powerful, and maybe this has meant relatively greater maturity. In other words, the Egyptian and Saudi role in the region, and even the Turkish role, is more powerful than it was in 1980. Their economies are more robust, and as a result, they're less likely to be impetuous, even if they're dictatorial and repressive and completely unfair domestically, as the Egyptians and it seems MBS and Saudi is. They're not taking extremely rash actions to promote more conflict. They understand they're going to have to live with the consequences of that conflict. And so if I would take away something from what Jeffrey has said in general, it's that the Egyptians are someone we need to work with. We need to understand their domestic pressures and how we can not condescend to them. And the Iranians, they're not going anywhere, but hopefully they're going to have another regime soon and we can marshal his thoughts on how to work with them in a kind of post-Ayatollah scenario. Inshallah. Well, that's it for this week. If you too want to help order the disorder, you can tap follow right now and you'll be notified when every new episode launches. We're also on social media. Search for Disorder Show. Finally, you can read more about today's topic by visiting our show notes. And you can subscribe to our Substack there too, which gives lots of interesting and exciting extra content about how we make the shows and deeper dives into the topics of the show. Would you like to ask a question? Well, we'd love to know what you're thinking. You can email us at disordershow, one word, at gmail.com. And as always, we love to thank our brilliant producer, who is George McDonough, and our sterling executive producer, Neil Fern. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope you have an excellent week.